Welcome to today's webinar uh, in the series organized by the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism. Uh, we're going to get started in a moment. We're a little bit ahead of the hour, but uh, delighted to have uh, people joining us today for uh, a further installment in this series, which has done so much work to expand our understanding of linguistics in, in many different forms, sociolinguistic dimensions, um, uh, applied linguistics, so many in different areas that have come under discussion. Uh, the, the CALM Center is part of the Moore Institute, and I'm director of the Moore Institute. My name is Daniel Carey. So again, welcome everyone today. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Matthew Garrity, who works in the Moore Institute, and he is looking after the technical side of things. So thank you to, to Matthew. Uh, I can mention that we invite you to use the Q&A uh, side to ask your questions uh, as they arise during the session. Um, I also wanted to congratulate uh, the directors of, of Calm. So that, that's uh, today's host, in effect, who's Dr. Stanislava Antonievich Elliott. Uh, Stasha is going to be chairing, as I mentioned, and she co directs this, the center with Dr. John Wall. So, again, thank you to, to both of you uh, for being such sources of inspiration in this area of, of research and discussion. So, Stasha, really, it's now over to you and uh, very much looking forward to today's contribution. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, it's my real pleasure to uh, introduce Peter Milin. Peter Milin is a long time my colleague. We studied uh, together uh, at the University of Novi Sad and then worked there together for, for a number of years. And it's really my pleasure to, to welcome him now uh, in Galway. We hoped that this seminar would be on campus and hopefully we will have a chance to repeat it on campus, but unfortunately still staying online. On the other hand, that gives chance to lots of people to join. So uh, just a few words to introduce Peter. So as I said, he started, he studied, uh, um, his, he did his BSc and MA in psychology uh, at the University of Novi Sad, where he started his career later. Uh, and he did his PhD at the University of Belgrade. Um, so he, uh, he started first in no working in Novi Sad and then uh, between 2013 and 2016, uh, he spent two years as a se senior researcher uh, in the quantitative linguistics group uh, with Professor Harald Bain. Uh, in Tübingen, and then uh, between 2016 and 2019, uh, he had a position of senior lecturer in data science at the University of Sheffield. And finally, since uh, 2019, he uh, holds a position as senior lecturer in the psychology of language and language learning at the University of Birmingham. Peter's primary re research interests are concentrated in areas concerned with understanding the crucial role of learning in human languages, its behavior and use. And previously, Peter's works, uh, work focused on investigating word uh, or lexical processing. And this now in, extends to, to uh, on uh, the study of natural communication. Uh, methodologically, Peter's work combines experimentation and computational modeling with advanced statistical data analysis. And the group that he works with is called Out of Our Minds, uh, uh, placed in uh, the University of Birmingham. And they work together uh, towards uh, in-depth understanding of language knowledge and natural ways of learning language. Uh, one thing that I would like to, to say about Peter because before he starts is that Peter was always methodologically really detailed and uh, uh, always kind of used um, uh, the latest possible methodologies and uh, was always very clear in and, and kind of clean in his methodology to the point that uh, he would say to, to his supervisors, who sometimes were really kind of renowned uh, uh, people in, in the area he researched, he would say, well, you can't do it that way because of this or that uh, methodological part. So uh, this is why I really love to, to listen to Peter's talk, because it's not only interesting topic and interesting methodology, 
but it's all also methodologically really very sound and today's talk i think will contribute to that so uh, just before i i uh, uh, in, uh, let Peter speak. Um, I just want to say that uh, during the talk, please put your questions in the Q and A section. So, Petra, please. Hello, hi, hi, everybody. I will start sharing my screen. I hope this will work now. <clears throat> Okie dokie. This looks good. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased and, and, and honored to, to, to be with you guys. I, I was also hoping um, that I will be in three dimensions in Galway because that's always a pleasure to visit. Um, but you, you will need to deal with me in, 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 on flat screens. Uh, so um, despite this, I, I will, uh, let's say that I will start with, with one of Stasha's remarks that I was always keen to do the latest and greatest, uh, especially statistical uh, uh, modeling uh, tools. But that's the reason why the title is Back to the Future, because now we are kind of going back to, to, into the past and using something that, is, that was there quite early in, 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 in time, so to say. But uh, let's begin with, with um, how uh, a colleague of mine and, and, and dear collaborator Dagmar Divyak and, and, and I started collaborating and this is very much our, our um, joint project out of our minds and uh, we co-lead the team uh, with the same name. So it started by, by conver uh, as conversation between uh, uh, usage-based linguist, which is Dagmar and, and effectively experimental psychologist or, uh, or uh, psychologist of learning, if, if you wish. Um, and uh, we, we very soon we realized that we have many complementary and, and uh, on top of shared interest in language, we also have many complementary interests. And then we started developing uh, um, the framework for research. And I will start by trying to give some very, very quick uh, overview of, of the the basic ideas, and then to, to um, say more and or, or present those ideas in, in two case studies. So first thing, if you, um, okay, this works now. If you go and, and look at what usage-based linguists uh, uh, would say about language is that it considers this to be a, a complex adaptive system uh, dynamic and uh, that the one that emerges from usage and is shaped by usage. And then the idea is also that the, the, the process itself is mediated by some kind of general uh, cognitive abilities. You know why it's not? Okay, now it's fine. So general cognitive abilities that were particularly interesting to linguists were things like classification, generalization, imagination. And then they were also curious about certain uh, constructs coming from the psychological side, which would be memory and attention. And memory is particularly interesting to, to uh, usage-based linguists because they really like frequency effect and very much in one way or another, they would assume that frequency effect is effectively or in essence, a, a memory effect, if you wish. But what is peculiar in this whole business, and this was our first interaction and conversation, is that there is a peculiar absence of how emergence take place uh, to begin with. And when you go back a little bit into literature and try to figure out what happened historic historically, then you see that there is a huge elephant in the room and there is a, a, a absence of learning uh, from any research on, on language. And learning would be a kind of a natural way to, to understand emergence. So things do emerge through learning and, 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 and uh, this is, um, as I said, possibly the most natural way to think about emergence itself. Um, it's, it's, uh, we, we see only relatively recent resurgence of, of learning 
based ideas in research and language and only from 2000 onwards, but, but it still needs to, to, to make a full comeback on to linguistic C. Of course, the, the, the usual suspect about what happened with learning and, and language is uh, Chomsky's uh, review of, of Skinner's verbal behavior book. Um, it was it was extremely well two things it was very efficient and it was very brutal so somehow i um my personal i can rant about chomsky's influence on, on psychology and linguistics for hours i believe but um i think that uh what he did is actually that he managed to change the landscape of research in both linguistics and cognitive psychology in particular high cognition uh, like um, thoroughly. Uh, interesting fact is that there were two other uh, reviews of the same book coming from really famous psychologists such as Broadbent and Osgood, but these reviews didn't receive that level of attention. And then if you look, there is a, research, a little bit of research showing that effectively for a, a one citation given to original book, you would have two citations uh, sent to to uh, review to to Chomsky's review, so that's an interesting. You have something that is more cited than uh, the, the the original, uh, uh, which is which is kind of peculiar situation. Um, only in two thousand six, um, I think that uh, Nick Ellis was the first to reintroduce ideas of general principles of learning as applied to language learning and specifically to L2, to second language learning. And he was talking about those basic learning effects such as blocking, overshadowing, uh, uh, cue salience and things like that. And then he was running all series of, of, of uh, case studies using or, or discussing uh, findings in, on, on, in those uh, Base, or using those basic principles. And then a bit later, um, Michael Ramskar and his collaborators started working on using the same ideas, but this time on, on L1 acquisition. So the first paper came with uh, as a case study on regular and irregular plurals in, in English. So that was the beginning, but then Move forward, the question is, okay, why on earth we would engage learning fine? It might be interesting to think about emergence in terms of, of actual something tangible like learning in, in coming from psychology or if you wish biology. But if you compare those two fields, uh, linguistics and psychology, um, and the way we, we, we discussed how to position our, our research program, uh, we came to conclusion that linguistics is very much interested in end result, result of learning. Uh, uh, linguists care about fully developed system that is complex and beautiful, and they would like to taxonomize everything and to make everything neat and, and tidy, like in this tool cabinet on the right hand side. While psychologists actually would be interested if you if you compare very generic definition of psychology you would say well it's it's about the process like uh, uh, behavior itself psychology is science of behavior and uh, um, psychological or mental processes and functions so one one science is kind of by nature uh, interested in functions or functionalistic if you wish of course there is functional linguistics but in general, or generally speaking, and linguistics is uh, mainly interested to, to understand the structure and, 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 and the architecture of the uh, complex system. So if you, if you cross these starting positions, if you wish, then you can come to conclusion, well, you know, process can help understand the end result, because then learning or this emergence itself can, can uh, shape or constrain what uh, uh, linguistic units or abstractions uh, should be. And, and this is even greater uh, commit, cognitive commitment um, uh, in a sense. And then on, on, on psychological side, 
uh, end result can help reverse engineering the process itself because now we find we kind of know and we have a beautiful challenge to learn what exactly and that's the language uh, we can try even further and ask this question once again and say okay why learning and i like to refer very much to uh, mars um, uh, famous three level of understanding of any complex system of course he was doing work in vision and perception and then in in um, um, i think it's a second edition there is a, a relatively well known um, um, commentary uh, like a closing of, of of that book by poggio who uh, added two more levels um, basically saying that david marr would agree that there are those two levels on top of of original three so originally marr was saying there is computation the, the the what question and then algorithm the how and i think that for better or worse uh, linguistics would be focusing on the what question and uh, psychology would would also like to engage with the how question understanding the function and the process itself then you have of course psychologists are moving downwards looking at the implementational level so now you have cognitive neuroscientists and and such but then Poggio was assuming a uh, uh, higher level um, for to which sitting on top of previous three is learning and then the evolution of learning machines. But interestingly enough, Poggio kind of concludes that understanding this complex system at the level of learning is perfectly adequate explanation all by itself. So you don't need other levels to understand what's going on. So this is where we we kind of begin in, in, in framing our research program. This is our research team. On the right hand side, you see Dagmar. And this is out of our minders, where and I will present uh, two case studies, uh, which are very much in, in focus of our uh, funded research, uh, funded by Levy Hume uh, uh, Trustee. And uh, the first study is before actually before I move to to first study, I want to to do a little bit of disclaimer because sometimes people get too excited about what we actually want to say. So on one hand, uh, it's possible to do a lot with new deep learning approach, which would imply that you want to do as well as possible. We, we are less interested in that. I'm not saying that we are not looking into that very carefully and, and with great interest, but we like to keep things as cognitively plausible as, as possible. On the other hand, we also don't think that learning is the ultimate answer to everything. It can help us dem 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 demystify emergence. Um, that is what we, we think. So uh, as for computational learning machine that sits at the heart of our program, this is a, a simple Rescorla-Wagner rule, which was firstly defined 10, 12 years before Rescorla-Wagner uh, by Vidro van Hoff, also known as Delta rule. Um, so in, in effect, those two uh, uh, rules are identical, but Vidro van Hoff uh, and how we're working in, in uh, engineering domain. And then very much this uh, parallel distributed uh, uh, story was a little bit forgotten, partly because serial machines became very cheap and, and very successful. And then there was also this criticism by Minsky and Puppert who said that those uh, basic principles of learning are too um, they, they don't have enough capacity and power to explain things that are actually interesting. Um, 12 years later, almost like independently from the, the original work of Vidrov and Hoff uh, uh, in Vidrov's lab, um, Rescola and Wagner came with their own rule, which was inspired by, by um, a range of uh, empirical phenomena from learning and classical conditioning in particular. And then, by the way, uh, uh, this uh, vidrov hoff rule also resurrected in, in uh, self-organizing 
map done by Korkonen in machine learning. So you have two, two uh, domains of research where this rule kind of kicked in uh, about a decade later. Uh, principle of learning is very simple. So it actually has uh, the, the, the essence of any definition of learning that it's some sort of change and typically you say stable change. So you have this delta, uh, which, uh, um, st st which is a term for, for change in weight between certain signals and certain, let's say, important outcomes. So some objects or events in the environment. So this is the connection between the two and what learning, uh, how learning is defined in this particular case is that this is basically um, a previous association strength, which is uh, just a w, w here uh, plus some change. And that change can be positive it, it, if both Q or that signal and an outcome are present, or you need to correct for erroneous prediction. And that's why whole whole family of this type of learning is called error correction learning. They're kind of quite well known in, in the literature under that name. So importantly, you need, uh, you need to remember that, uh, uh, that Yoda was right, as always, that basically we learn through, uh, by learning from errors or recovering from errors, if you wish. Uh, there, there are a bunch of relatively recent studies coming from biology, for example, to show that basically this simple, and it's one of, if not the simplest uh, uh, um, type of or, or model of learning, has great evolutionary fitness, has some advantages in comparison with more powerful, but potentially more greedy uh, types of learning. Um, so, on to uh, case studies. So first case study is about English article system. Uh, this paper is uh, uh, revised and, and is about, I think in, in, in day or two, we will resubmit back to linguistics and hoping to have something out in, in a few months time. So um, if you think about the article system, it's interesting because it seems that it is completely uninteresting for native speakers. They use it a lot and they don't have much problems with it, but for L2 learners, and especially those who are coming from articles languages, uh, they present a big problem and they are really hard to master. So you see this, this is a, a, a picture taken in Japan uh, at the time of the last uh, cognitive linguistic con conference in Osaka. So what we know about articles, more generally speaking, is that they're quite rare across languages. There is about 8% of languages that have definite and indefinite articles. And they are mainly concentrated in Western Europe, but when they exist, they exist a lot. So every fifth word roughly is an article. So <clears throat> this is where we are. And it's also known that they, they even cause some issues to, for native speakers. For example, there, there, there were many interesting and peculiar errors in segmentation in, in, in French. And it's also known from L1 um, acquisition that children have uh, 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 demonstrate quite limited flexibility. So at the beginning, it seems that they basically learn articles with, with certain nouns and things are quite fixed. And only later with enough uh, exposure, gradually, once when sufficient item-based knowledge kicks in, they can build up the, the, the article system. So it's not without difficulties even for L1 um, learners. But if you, if you look at what's, what's going on in, in all kinds of grammars, and we are particularly interested in combination of, 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 of let's say, cross dialogue between Polish as, as, as a typical Slavic language and English. Um, so we, we are looking into these kind of combination when you have Polish as your L1 and you have English as your L2. Um, but we are also looking the other way around. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see if you, if you kind of scheme over pedagogical grammars, 
that what is quite common is that many of those are um, professing it's about specificity. There are some disagreements, but there's, there's, uh, there is this, this one rule that say it's, it needs to be specific and so on and so forth. Uh, somehow you start thinking, well, it's a simple three-way choice, how hard it can be in the end. But then you, you end with, with one possibility and that is to learn uh, many uh, exceptions, so to say. And if you think about things like this, there is no common sense. So you can do other geographic terms, but you can also do sports. So I, I cannot say I play, play the tennis, but I can say I play the, the guitar. And because my mother tongue is, well, you can say either uh, Serbian or Croatian or even Hungarian, they are all articles. So I really struggle and this, I'm very emotional about this particular studies. It's, it's kind of personal. Um, so, we can ask another question and we wanted to start digging into this problem. And then we said, okay, let's take a decent sample of, of, of realistic sentences. Let's remove articles, about 200 of them. And we gave that to a sample of native speakers, 60, 60 native speakers of English. And let's see how well they would do on this task to insert a, a, a correct article. And they did quite good job. So in average, 80% or, or more. And in many instances, in fact, when you look in details, then you see that, well, you know, you can use another article. It's not just that there is one uh, correct uh, possibility. So there is variation to that. But when we applied and use the same information and apply this to our simple uh, uh, algorithm, we got just an epic fail. That was terrible. So the, 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 the correct instances were roughly between 10 and 15%, but that was just really, really bad. So it seems what this simple exercise using computational modeling and, and a bit of statistics um, taught us is that, well, if you need to learn article system, you cannot learn from uh, by trying to predict article using other words in context. So basically uh, a, a learning machine, if you wish, it got a sentence, uh, but empty place uh, for, for an article. And the question, uh, can you figure out, given all those words in context, uh, can you figure out what article would be correct in this instance? So this might not be that surprising for linguists, maybe not so even for psychologists, but it might be surprising for computer scientists because we also trained uh, with, with a colleague of ours, collaborator, uh, Bert on this task. And Bert was uh, really, really good above eight, 90%. So there was a statistical margin um, and, and Bert was better than let's say average human participant in this. So Bert somehow does something that is almost like a superhuman. But then when you think, and this is our concern about jumping immediately into deep learning models, is that you lose tractability. Bert has uh, 3 billion words uh, corpus to, to train, to practice. And then it has practically unlimited memory. And on top of that, it had uh, more than 100 million free parameters to tune and to figure out the, 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 the problem. So this is kind of really a superhuman. And our simple algorithm, it just failed ter terribly. So, but then let's go back and think a bit more about, okay, what? So if this is not the case, you cannot figure out the article from, from words in, in the context. So what uh, or how do humans do this task? Because they can do it and they learn how to do it. Uh, one, one potential uh, uh, starting point is to think that words, uh, actually they evoke all kinds of frames and semantic relationship. Uh, so they, they come as, a, as kind of a structure packages of, of knowledge and, and all kinds of expectations. So uh, it's just, uh, uh, almost like an addition to, to uh, other sources of information. If you think about uh, a restaurant, then 
uh, you already know and you can already relate all other kind of uh, concepts that are uh, 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 related with the, with the notion or concept of, of restaurant like food or waiters or bell or eating and so on and so forth. But this is not present in, 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 in uh, strictly speaking, in, in sentences in that way. So somehow this, this packages of, of, of information are uh, external to language. So what we were starting looking into more carefully is uh, this idea coming from linguistics and also from philosophy also known as semantic wheels. So you have one thing that exists, uh, um, and this is interesting, that, that one thing that exists in these pedagogical grammars, this is specificity, this is specific referent plus or minus. And then another thing that seems to be very important for the semantic wheel is here and knowledge. So which could also be known or unknown to hear. Um, so if you look, uh, and, and then we went back to uh, Corpus and looked at the, at the wider context saying, OK, let's take a uh, uh, target sentence or a sentence with the target article uh, being in the middle. And then let's take three sentences before and three sentences after and then figure out what's going on. So here you have suddenly the tears and why is this known to here because or or why it should be the or why it's specific because there were no mentioning of anything tier like in that particular sentence but if you go back you see semantically related thing which is crime so somehow you you build that link and then we said okay in this particular case we can tag this situation saying it's known to here it's specific it's countable it's plural and there is no elaboration so this is what kind of these features would, would uh, uh, trigger a definite article in this particular case. So we said, okay, let's tag more. Let's use those simple binary categories like known, unknown to hear, specific uh, referent or not specific referent, countable, yes, no, plural. Only elaboration has more categories than two, but the rest is, is just effectively binary. And then we, we uh, uh, made a sample of, of more than um, 1,500 sentences, pretty nice, pretty balanced. And then we said, okay, let's uh, think about this as, as a statistical classification problem. So if you want to do a good classification, uh, one uh, possible approach is to use uh, uh, decision trees. And then on top of it, uh, you can do random forest to confirm that sometimes decision tree can overfit and do particularly well results. But if you do random forest, you basically confirm that results are replicable. So that's kind of, uh, uh, um, kind of quite radically simplified situation. What we did in this sample, we removed, this is important maybe to mention, uh, so it was balanced, but we removed set phrases because actually you don't have a choice. So set phrases behave almost like a lexical item. And we wanted to make things difficult for statistical classifier or for learning algorithm. So they needed to have some ambiguity in, 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 in that scenario. So once when we apply this, we got pretty good results. So above 92%, uh, uh, correct classifications of this three-way choice. And if you look at a particular tree, then you see that uh, high at the top, you have hearer knowledge. So once when you figure out whether a referent is known or unknown to hear, and let's say it's known to hear, then the choice needs to be made between definite article and then zero. You have very few cases of, of indefinite article, actually, I think only four or five, something like that. So in uh, the or definite article seems to be a default if it is known to hear, if the situation is known or, or a noun is known to hear. <clears throat> For zero to be used, if, uh, if we have known to hear a situation, then a uh, referent cannot be specific. And which makes sense because we know that uh, historically speaking, the developed from demonstrative uh, pronouns and now needs to be either uncountable or in plural. 
Well, in, in case if a uh, referent is uh, present as unknown, so this is the second part of the tree, then you have uh, um, indefinite article as default, and you need to figure out um, um, zero article with no instances of definite article on, on this side of the, of the tree. So here you have only four or five instances of indefinite article, but here you don't have a definite article at, at all. So unknown to here makes a problem binary between, uh, uh, or logistic if you wish, between uh, indefinite article and no article at all. So uh, basically, uh, here a knowledge seems to be very powerful predictor, uh, and uh, it's default for 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 um, for a definite article, and then it can be overridden to to bring more precision and to figure out which which uh, uh, which of the of the of the possibilities is actually correct one. Uh, if, if I wish to summarize this statistical analysis, one way to do it is to see the, 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 the informativity of a particular feature or predictor in, in terms of uh, a decrease in accuracy. So this means that if I would remove here a knowledge and, and try to run uh, decision tree, I would lose almost 90% in, in uh, accuracy. That's a lot. And then number and countability, um, those two come as um, second and third. Much less uh, importance you have in specificity and very little in elaboration. And in corpus, because we used BNC, I forgot that to mention, we used BNC and we had both spoken and, and written uh, uh, examples or, or trials. Um, so, What's the, what's the, let's say, take home message from this part of the, of the study? Um, it seems that key is uh, to think about uh, uh, partners in conversation. So speaker somehow needs to figure out what, they, what uh, she or he thinks he or should know about the situation in terms of uh, familiarity and how identifiable is particular thing. So it's like a, uh, I like a knowledge calibration. It's it's actually not determined, or maybe it's better to say it's a it's kind of a reference tracking device. But now going back to 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 to, to the basics and to, to to kind of main ingredients of, of research approach or methodology we we like to to pursue. Uh, we, we need to go back and figure out whether simple error-driven learning or error correction learning can actually learn if once it has uh, proper information. So we figure out it will be terrible if you assume that other words in sentences, and we gave many of those, will contain information that is useful to say which article is in, in, in particular instance. But what if we give those package of information like known or unknown to hear a specific reference or not, number and, and accountability and such. Again, I'm reminding you that you have learning via two simple changes. It's either strengthening of connection between Q and outcome or weakening if uh, another, uh, if, if, if an outcome is not present, but something else is present. So if, if you want to, to know more about this uh, um, error correction learning video of and, and Riscola Wagner, maybe you should just check our blogs. I think that we have series of three blogs. I think it's eight, nine, and 10, presenting in very simple way what is, what, what's, let's say, mechanics of, of, of uh, Riscola Wagner learning. But again, importantly, it's about error. <clears throat> So what we did here, we just run a simple simulation and run iterative learning, giving sentence by sentence uh, example or chunks of seven sentences to be, to be exact. And then with those specific information of known, unknown to hear, whether it's a spoken language or written language, so all, all information that were available to our statistical classifier, to our decision tree. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, actually, 
this simple learning principle can figure out what's important for, for what. So very soon it, it singles out a love relationship between known to hear, light blue, and definite article. And then if, if you have unknown to hear, which is dark blue, and paired with, with the uh, uh, singular and countable nouns, it should be uh, indefinite article. But then if you compare this uh, countability and number, if it is plural or uncountable, then you go with zero. And then you have a little bit of more support or, or to tighten things up, completely up. If you have generic reference, it should be zero. So dark green, it goes with zero. Those are positive weights. And then if you have a specific reference, then it should be the, but that's much weaker. Actually for the, you have uh, um, uh, known to hear a single most dominant uh, cue to predict correctly what's, what's going on. So this is kind of cool, but then the, the, the question is what, what, what will happen if we try to, to approach to this to, to, with this information to the problem of L2 learn. So can we make this more uh, like the, the whole, the overall experience more like uh, resembling L1 knowledge and, and learning experience? Uh, and before I dive into that part of the study, uh, I just want to, to go to, or to make step or a couple of steps back and, 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 and make a point about something that is kind of very central uh, as a general notion uh, in our research and something that we uh, engage when we think about learning. Um, and this is something that is known in literature for very long, for decades. It's a pre-exposure -pre effect. It's probably known for centuries now, if you think historically about development of, of, of learning research. Um, so what is pre-exposure? Uh, I, I like to define in a very simple term as some sort of a reduction in systematicity uh, or con the, the, the robustness of contingency between Q and outcome. But it can happen in many forms or it, it can take many shapes. You can have um, uh, um, pre-exposure of context or, 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 or background or, 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 or of whole ambient, which somehow becomes irrelevant. And when finally you have some informative cue and outcome situation, some kind of a good predictive uh, uh, contingency, then it doesn't happen. It's because systematicity was ruined because nothing was happening for a very long time in this particular situation. I was never uh, having any, any relevant outcome or any, any relevant cue. And then it can happen also with Q. So Q can be, a, or Q can establish uh, uh, irrelevant consequences or no particular up, uh, outcome, which is in literature also known as latent inhibition. And then finally you have pre-exposure of outcome, which also kind of cripples the results of learning. So overall, all these situations are uh, somehow learning or predictivity is affected because you what you do in this error correction learning you learn and then you try to predict and if it's correct then you strengthen the association if it's wrong then you weaken it so that's the error correction principle so now keep in mind this situation where we randomize those those uh, 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 learning events and then just throw it to machine and it picked up what 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 is actually important for each of those uh, uh, particular um, articles. But what if we slightly modify our, our simulation exercise and we say, okay, but if you have L1 and L2, then an L1 is articles, let's say Polish in this instance. What if uh, I learn no consequences? So I have some kind of a pre exposure effect, and then I have the same situation like with, with this, with the first uh, simulation. Uh, but now, assuming something that is quite generous, saying that uh, because now you have two languages, so, so let's say that one third of language experience will be in L2, which is, again, I say quite generous, because I think that more than often, actually, people have less exposure to L2. 
and in, the, in this particular case to English, if you wish, through schools and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's say that you have that much experience. So one third is in, in L, L2 in English and the rest two thirds are in still in Polish. So these are results. Everything is the same. You first have deadlines because there are no consequences for, for articles that, that, that polishes articles. But what is what the system figure out is that if, if I'm in Polish and that's, uh, uh, that's black uh, line, I should not use articles. Otherwise, if I'm in English, I should use some articles, but I don't some article, but I don't know which one, because those two strengths are approximately very similar. You have a little bit of help from known to hearer, but not really much. Uh, uh, and, and more importantly, what is known or unknown to hear is typically not used in, in language teaching. So what is used in language teaching is uh, specificity, as we said. The rest, if you see, is just the whole mess. I mean, there is nothing. The, so, um, sorry, then uh, we can say, okay, let's do another exercise and say, okay, there is a teacher whom I trust completely and she told me specificity is very important. Uh, so we can simulate these situations rather than starting from no connection whatsoever in this learning matrix. So, which means that all weights are set to zero. Let's assume that she told me this is an important good stuff. So I will start by setting this particular connection weight to maximum to one. So what will happen in that scenario? Everything else keep constant and remove uh, here or known to here or unknown to here. So this is situation if, if you believe your, your teacher, so you see that it's even worse. So suddenly uh, uh, both singular and plural are, are somehow best, best weights for no article. English is still the strongest for, um, um, for uh, 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 or an. And then this is also mass, both singular and plural, and also both specific and, and, and generic reference. So this is really not helpful. English is, is as a cue for definite article is, is basically there is no connection between English language and definite article in comparison with indefinite article. So this is kind of quite weird. And in, 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 uh, as, as a possible summary, we can say, well, it's messy, but it seems to be learnable. So it's, it's messy in the sense that you have no clear, simple associations or rules and you, you don't have clear, simple cues. But it seems to be learnable if you think in terms of uh, reference tracking system. And why it's so difficult, we believe and we argued in our paper that this is because somehow we need to, to turn things upside down. Rather than, uh, I mean, what, what, what I want to say is that Polish people know whether it's known or unknown to hear. That's not, it's just not Mark, it's not my responsibility. Somehow you as hearer needs to keep track of this thing. But suddenly when I need to talk to you in English, I need to, to explicitly uh, track this stuff. Do you know that or not? And then I need to mark that as, as, a, as, as, as I said, as a <clears throat> reference tracking system. Moving on to second case study. This is now on Polish and it's, it's a weird case of allomorphy in, in genitive singular nouns. This was published last year in, in Journal of Language Cognition and Neuroscience. And these are the lists or, or pictures of, of collaborators. <clears throat> Anyways, so how this story started, this is also a peculiar case in Polish. It costs uh, headaches, but not just again for L2 learners, it's also, there is a funny story coming from, I think, 2018, somehow before COVID. There was a blog posted on, on the site of Polish Copy Editing Agency. There was a question of which genitive suffix you should use in masculine inanimate nouns, and those nouns would be phone, tablet, laptop, and others. So it can be quite uh, uh, annoying situation to figure out what which one is correct. <clears throat> and then, uh, this this issue was uh, so this is this is this is what happened in this particular blog. 
But this issue was known way back in, in history. So in 50s, you have like more than 300 pages of Westfall's book where he, he tried to make a sensible categorization of, of instances of when it should be one ending and when it should be another. But then he came, came up with very kind of strange, let's say, hierarchy of, of classes. And then you have uh, groups within those classes and then types. So he would end with, I don't know, metals and rings, toys and so on. Other parts of plants, parts of flowers, flowers. So those are different categories, not the same. It, it, it reminded me of this Borghese, uh, uh, I think it's a novel like Celestial Empor Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge where Borghese does this weird categorization of animals to those that belong to emperor, those that look like flies from the distance and all kinds of very, very funny taxonomy of animals. So this looks like it's completely useless, but in the end, I think that, uh, that Westfall just gave up and he said, well, there is something elegant in U and something rough in, in A. But you can find other funny examples. So for example, they would say uh, front parts typically take A and rear parts typically take U, but then not the front part and not the, 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 the bum effectively. So they would take another. So uh, in conclusion, Dabrowska said there are no default ending, no rules, nothing whatsoever. And our designated linguist in this research, in this study was Jarek. And he said, okay, let's do a proper linguistic job. Let's go to, to from, from, from scratch. I will take usual suspects from phonology. I will take the same from morphology. I will take semantics in consideration as well. So I have all neat, and, and tidy categories and let's see whether I can predict what's going where. So which ending should I use in, in particular instance? But when you look statistically, it's either that those categories do not apply to all instances because the way they cross, they, they, they just don't exist in certain situations. So um, you, you either reduce the sample. So for example, uh, phonological typicality is applicable only to something about 35% of cases, so roughly one third. And then for entity size, which is one of other semantic usual suspect, that would be just 25%. And for morphological uh, features, that would be even less than 23% or something like that. So, and, and if you look at these classifications, then you see that they are, they are very much off because you have uh, colored bars, which are observed frequencies. And then you have what's predicted if you believe that this is a useful uh, information, useful feature to categorize. So these things are very much off. If you look here, somehow with abstract nouns, you, you, you have the tendency in, this, in the correct direction at least, but here with countable nouns, it's completely, uh, in different, in the wrong direction. So then you can ask question, okay, how on earth the system survives? And then again, we apply the simple simulation uh, uh, exercise. And we said, okay, let's assume that we have 10 uh, noun uh, uh, stems. And let's assume that six of those are, they all appear with equal frequency. So we removed frequency effect but you have six of those that would always appear with one ending. Let's say this is a default ending. And you have three of those that appear with the other ending. And then you have one stem, which is, which is difficult. And it takes 50, it's, it's, it's a chance level. It has 50, 50% 50 to be either, to end with either of the two. So let's see whether this very simple, naive, a way of learning can pick up what's going on. And this is the result of this simple exercise. So basically what you have here is that the system figure out, this is more frequent ending. So this is the strongest cue. So 60% of, 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 of types are actually taking this. So if I need to guess, this would be better. Uh, uh, six particular stems are also uh, uh, developed with, with a positive association with this particular ending. And then of course, those three that are taking the other, they, they establish negative association weight with that ending. Interestingly enough, 
that difficult guy that has 50 50 percent to take either of the two that that one was slightly negative for default ending and then it's a different situation for for uh, less typical ending non-canonical ending so you have correct uh, 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 co correctly pick up the, the these three stems that are always taking a, uh, and then you have six negatives for those that are taking uh, only uh, u ending. You have some positive association, and this is exactly thirty percent. So you have thirty of these and and sixty of these. So this is really reflecting frequency type frequency effect, if you wish, because frequency of tokens were all equal. But interestingly enough, the association weight with this difficult J, which takes 50-50, is actually positive. So here with, with canonical ending, it's negative, and here it's, it's slightly positive. Not much, but slightly. And I will return to, this, to that a bit later. Now, because we see that this might work in, in, in an axis size, then we said, okay, let's scale up and let's let's run NDL uh, in this case pi NDL, which can run and train on the whole corpora using Riscola Wagner um, learning. And I will just go briefly on how is it, this is done. So originally, in the first study from 2011, what we did, we trained uh, as we used as cues sequences letter triplets. Sometimes those could be pairs, but typically those are triplets. We replaced, uh, um, we used hashtag as, as a marker for beginning and for the end of sentence. And then we trained on, on all possible word forms in this large corpus. And then you end with, with, uh, with learning matrix. And then you figure out, oh, these cues are positively associated with this particular word form. These two are somewhat weakened, but they are still positively associated with this word form. This is a negative and strong association. This is also negative, but not that strong association, and so on and so forth. So all possible trigraphs in that given language, in this case Polish, with a whole bunch, so whole dictionary of, of, of word forms, we typically take about 60, 65,000 word forms. <clears throat> so in 2017, uh, I was really obsessed with uh, all kinds of structural information that we can uh, get from, from those uh, uh, learning matrices, risk of wagner learning matrices. And then we published a paper um, and, uh, and basically presented that beside activation, which was used from, let's say, connection is time, you, you, would, you, would have, you would say, okay, you have some input or you have some cues and you sum them up and see how much they activate whatever this particular word form or how much they activate other, other word forms and so on and so forth. But you can also take those cues that are in the input and say, okay, how diverse, how much variation or confusion they bring. And this is called diversity, which means how, or in other words, it's how much competition they would bring. You can think about this measure as, as, as a measure of <clears throat> uh, deviation but it's not standard deviation. We just use the sum of absolute values, which is uh, something that is typically used in, 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 in uh, uh, vector matrix algebra as, a, as one of the absolute deviation, uh, one of the simple measure of, of deviation. Um, and then you can also look in how well this, word, uh, this particular word form is entrenched in, 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 in the prior experience or from the prior experience in long-term memory, if you wish. And then you have the same measure of diversity, but this time looking over diversity in columns rather than in rows. So if you present your learning matrix with letter triplets in rows and, and word forms in columns, then you can see if I take this absolute sum of absolute values uh, across rows, I will have diversity of cues of how much competition they bring. And if I look column wise, then I will see how well entrenched particular word is. And interestingly enough, this prior is really highly correlated with frequency, with good old frequency, but often in statistical modeling, it does slightly better in, in, in terms of predictivity 
in some regression model than just plain frequency. Then we train another matrix where we just used uh, uh, other words from context to predict uh, 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 board forms. Again, this is very much what you can say, this is what word to vec does. And as I said, again, you can look things like prior of how well this word is entrenched in experience with many other words and also uh, this this lexical diversity of how many other words this word uh, or how many uh, over how many different contexts this word is uh, uh, spread so this is contextual diversity and then on top of that we also try this something that is called typicality so you can you can calculate uh, some or average of all vectors in your learning matrix and then you compare your target word form with that average. And if it diverges a lot, then that word is more and more atypical. When we use this, this information, these this variables in, in regression model, we got from, from, um, from Grapheme network, let's call it G2F, Grapheme to, to form uh, network, uh, we, we learned that basically final trigraph activates very few words and they, they sound atypically in Polish. So then you would have preference for A ending. Otherwise, if it activates many words, you have big diversity and it sounds typically Polish, then you would have U ending. From the other learning network, um, these A words are poorly or they're represented in poorer way in experience. So, so prior is low and they also are less typical. On the other hand, U ending would have strong representation in experience in long-term memory and they would be semantically more typical. So you would have atypical sound sequence, poorly entrenched and overall atypical word. You would have, on the other hand, typical sound sequence, well entrenched and typical words. So we are going back to Westfall's elegant U and rough A. Interestingly enough, and now I'm going back to our first simulation, all borrowings are typically taking A ending, which is, uh, if you think about the first uh, simulation exercise, we saw that you have a positive uh, inclination when you have a, a, a stem, that has 50-50% chance to, to, to be either of the, to take either of the two endings, it will take the less, uh, the, the non-canonical one. So that in this case, this is R. And this is exactly what fell out from, from that simple exercise. Borrowings, which you can assume they, are, they have 50-50 chance to be either of the two, they will take rough ending. <clears throat> now we wanted to test the cognitive plausibility we ran an experiment. We had about 200 native speakers of Polish. We created very simple um, uh, Polish, very short uh, Polish sentences. And we gave target uh, stems and, and asked them to choose what, what ending would be correct in this case. What we got is that this uh, uh, final trigraph diversity is predictive of the tendency among participants. So. If, it, if you have this exactly what we saw in previous graph, this final trigraph activates very few words and I typical sound for Polish, you would have a ending of pseudo words in Polish. And otherwise, if diversity is high, you would have tendency to pick U ending for those pseudo words. So what's takeaway me me message? It is faith faithful to experience, uh, but we are actually talking of uh, different types of abstractions overall. It's almost like in this uh, uh, famous uh, uh, movie uh, when when uh, Emperor says to, to to Mozart, "It's a nice too many notes. If you if you if you remove some, just cut, cut a few, and it will be perfect." This means what Westwell started with ending with too many notes, too many categories and distinctions, and and in the end. Um, this, these patterns, they do emerge, but not in the way we expected originally. We don't consider, or linguists would not consider them typically. 
Uh, and to wrap up uh, my, my, my overall talk, um, um, I think we all in the team uh, like very much to think again about language as complex adaptive system, but maybe we are actually talking of more than one system. So you have this story um, that you have this position paper of five races group that language is complex adaptive system. You have other papers. Nick Ellis also did something relatively recent on, on, on that topic, some kind of an overview <clears throat> paper. But if you think about language, um, so language information is not constant, so salience can change both online while you are actually using, experiencing language, but also historically in a longer run. And then uh, our reception or comprehension needs to also adapt, so it's another dynamical system that kind of synchronize uh, or those two systems needs to synchronize with one another. So when language events are confusing or difficult, now become unremarkable, odd um, from, from learning perspective, and the cognitive system needs to respond. So it takes more time with more resources, makes more errors, and so on and so forth. But how complex is this simple associative learning? And I, I will end with this. Uh, so first of all, it's, it's known from beginning of time, but definitely from, from kind of mature phase of behaviorism even that queue outcome contingency is almost never perfect. Almost, you have many cues which live as a compound. You also have focal cues and context, um, which, which builds to, to, to this complexity or difficulty. So you actually have many imperfect cues in those compounds. And it's known, as I said, from early on, from, from, from mature version of, of behaviorism and Talmud was hammering and, and repeating that there is there are many imperfect contingency and that's what makes but that on one hand that's what drives learning and that what it makes it so uh, difficult to 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 predict how learning will take uh, off if you wish so uh, from 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 this simple principle of learning what we know is that uh, the less frequent the outcome the more unlearning it will induce because more often it will be absent and then you need to error correct. And the more complex the contingency are, um, then the less important each individual cube will be. And that's very typical for language. You have many cues uh, that coexist at the same time. So things are, these things are very complex. So definition of, of a, a learning situation or ingredients in this learning situation are, are many. Uh, so even simple classical conditioning shows considerable richness, both in relation it represents and in way its representation influences other behavior. And its primary means by which organism represents the structure of its world. That was said by uh, Ariscola many, many years ago. And more recently you have all kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, slow coming back on the scene of this apparently simple way of learning. So there are studies that show that uh, this kind of associative or classical conditioning type of learning has its place in decision making and all kinds of high level cognition in social learning and in including imitation. So if you want to do this kind of interdisciplinary uh, um, enterprise or journey, if you wish, then let's put learning in, in, in the heart of it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter, for this really lovely, interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, I would like to uh, remind people to put their questions into Q&A section. And uh, we don't have any questions just yet, but uh, uh -huh. okay, so we have one uh, question. Do I uh, read the question or shall I let Daniela read, ask the question? Okay, I'll, I'll read it just in the terms of time. So Daniela Trenkic is asking, so one of the problems with this type of approach is that it looks at articles as if their reason the tray is semantic. Yet, the ironically, articles didn't emerge to express semantic meanings, 
that are already perfectly expressible in a system without articles, hence redundant, but due to uh, certain structural changes and pressures. When grammatical endings or nouns start to decline, to signal that what's coming next is a noun phrase, also the case who's doing what to whom to start with, do you think your model may do a better job if you consider that semantics is not the main driving force for motivating the use emergency of articles, but grammar? Um, it's a very long question, but thank you very much. I'm trying to figure out which parts of this. Uh, so first, what, what is better in this particular case? I think that we did a pretty good job. So if you think about these particular categories that we used, they worked really well. Um, so they had a couple of, of uh, let's say, uh, misclassification, first using decision tree, and then also, importantly, uh, was they, they were picked up by very simple learning rule um, in, in iterative learning. But um, I don't know, maybe this is worth discussing further because it's, 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 it's a very interesting question and it, it can raise all kinds of ideas to, to, to move on in that direction. This is the advantage of, of, uh, of using computational simulations because then, um, let's say, experimentation can become quite or reasonably cheap because then you can just feed the system with other type of information and see how far it gets. So as uh, uh, the, Stasius and my uh, supervisor used to say, it's an empirical question. And I think in this particular case, it can be answered reasonably easily. So with, uh, with another simulation, we know that if you want to predict an article from other words in context, so like, I don't know, Wittgenstein or Fiat or other guys were saying the meaning of word is in its context. So th this doesn't work actually. But if you, if you bring in uh, this kind of simple semantic wheel with this hero knowledge and specificity and, and, and noun and, and, uh, or number and, and countability, it works fairly fine. But it's interesting to, to see what grammatical categories would you like to feed to the system and see how well it, 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 it does the job. Okay. Okay, I will, uh, we have a question from Sarah Berto, but I'll return to that because uh, Joel Walters uh, is asking again, uh, continuing uh, uh, to refer to the articles. And he's asking, could you address some of the pragmatic aspects of articles? The citation above is a primitive study about historical genre and pragmatic aspects of the in English. I don't have access to abstract, to be honest. I just opened this web page. Um, could you ask some pragmatic uh, citation about is a primitive study? I, I don't have access to this study. I don't know. Perhaps it's available on, on, on um, if I would log in through my library and then download the paper that, that I, would happy, I, I would be happy to continue this discussion uh, later on because I, I, I don't have access to this, this, this paper right now. It says even no abstract on, on ResearchGate. Um, sorry. Okay, so uh, maybe we can then leave that for, for, for later. Yeah, I mean, I would be happy to take this discussion further, but just to have access and, and, and check what's in the paper exactly and, um, and take it from there. Okay, I will, we have one more question and then I'll return to Sarah Beto and then I think- Yeah, yeah. Just, just, to, just to wrap up this, the, to, to try to answer from, from kind of, uh, to try to answer to both Daniela and Joel, um, is basically this, this goes back to what I said in one of the uh, uh, big slides at the beginning of my talk is that we, neither of us in the team, me specifically, do not be, believe that learning will give all the answers. Uh, it's an interesting exercise to try and play with different cues and outcomes, but what, what uh, computation simulation forces you to do is to be very specific about, you already know the algorithm. If you use those simple guys like, like Riscola Wagner, you exactly know what it does and how it does that. 
But then you know you need to be very specific about your uh, uh, learning events, about what is the cue in this situation and what is the outcome. And then everything is overt. And then you can play the game and have very specific prediction and see, see the results of this. So that's what, what's worthy and doesn't it, of course, all these factors I would assume are important and they would bring something to, 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 to the table. Okay, I see that Joel uh, joined us kind of live. So mm -hmm. would you like to, to say a few words? Yeah, uh, can I put my picture on or you, uh, you just sure, want yeah. my name? Uh, that, all right, uh, uh, the talk was just phenomenal. Uh, 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 I haven't worked on uh, definite articles in 20 years. The, the study that I mentioned uh, uh, used uh, very primitive uh, 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 search of uh, using uh, the Gutenberg uh, uh, tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, should I, what should I answer here? Join as panelist or stay as attendee? There's something on my screen that says. Yeah, oh. if you join as panelist, you can um, put on your camera if you want, Joel. Actually, Petra, would you like to put your okay. camera on then? Uh, here, here oh. I am. Okay. Yeah, I can do that as well if, if I need. I'm sipping my tea, so. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> In disguise. In that study, what we did was we looked at uh, definite articles in English. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to Google it. Uh, it's not. I, I, I can probably download. If I'll send I, it. I'll send it to you. Just, but awesome. the, 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 be, yeah. uh, 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 we looked at uh, Shakespeare, Dickens, uh, uh, Mark Twain, Jules Verne, and then we also looked at uh, 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 Psych Review uh, and uh, the New York Times uh, science section, uh, and found obviously a historical. Uh, a trend to um, a greater and greater use of uh, definite articles. Uh, and the, the, we, we came to this because we were listening to uh, 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 radio announcers mm -hmm. and, and the radio announcers who, uh, who uh, tried to uh, uh, sound important and sound authoritative uh, sounded like they were using a lot, a lot more uh, uh, definite articles. So, obvious, so what we found in, in, in this primitive study was that in the New York Times, there were just so many more definite articles than, than there were in a journal like Psych Review. And, and, and the literary stuff, uh, 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 Dickens and Twain had, had, had uh, much fewer. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not a sociolinguist, but mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, I've uh, uh, played around there and, and uh, I, I once met uh, Lebov at a conference, and 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 he got real angry at me, and he said, "There's no such thing as language without uh, 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 social interaction and a social context." Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 what I was curious about is what, how can I mean your your, your uh, uh, methodologies and your theory are just uh, are just phenomenal. How can we put some more pragmatics in, into it? It's, it's uh, first of all, I mean, thank you very much for this question because my secret crush is actually stillometry and very much like this uh, uh -huh. differences in how, pe how people write and stuff. I was I was doing a little bit uh, of research in that, uh, but it's it's a long term crush. She <laughs> she likes me less, but I'm still kind of very faithful. Uh, I, I, I would assume that this would be a, a relatively straightforward computational exercise. Basically, then you need to feed in additional level of, of information in those cues, saying that this is a novel, this is another novel. This is exactly, you, you, you get completely different results if you would remove, as you saw in, in this, maybe that's a good, good uh, uh, parallel to make, once when we did our simulation, assuming only one language, and once when we just introduce something that is known in the literature background queue. And you can create whole whole hierarchy of background saying, well, you have a background queue, which is a novel, then you have a particular author, then you can have even uh, something else on top of it sitting in, in the hierarchy. Those are just simple cues. They need to be present or absent in, in, in learning event and then see how much this, this stupid learning machine can pick up. 
-hmm. It's again, it's not the, the, the game is not to be as good as possible, but to stay as simple as possible to really understand what drives learning dynamics and then to, to see how much it actually can pick up and then go back and say, well, it seems that it doesn't do a really good job. So it must be that there are some other cues that we were not like pragmatics and or other uh, 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 social strata, mm -hmm. uh, time, historical time that we are talking mm -hmm. about. So those are all interesting things that we can, yeah, yeah. We can we can uh, right. kind of put in the model and that would be awesome yeah this is uh, yeah this is something that that would be really interesting maybe there, this there's some, sorry I, I did a few uh reviews of of uh, attempts to use this uh authorship attribution and 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 figuring out the, the unique signature using learning approach various learning you know they were they were more interested of course coming from engineering they were interesting in toys so those learning machines rather than than uh, actual language uh, um, phenomenal of, of language per se um, um, so yeah i think there is yeah I will, I will definitely read this one and then we can talk more awesome i'll, I'll send it to you thanks very much I just thought maybe it's a good point then to add here um, Sarah Berto's question about, so she asked, have you ever considered applying proficiency levels in your studies? So if you have, let's say, a beginner, uh, L2 learner, intermediate um, prof uh, prof yeah, professional yeah. speakers, or even maybe translators who, who look into some kind mm -hmm. of ways of translating from one language to another. There is another study that we um, well, it got basically it got accepted, but we have some kind of minor corrections for language learning where we actually run simulations and uh, figure out individual differences in learning. And uh, it really un aligns nicely with what people are doing in experiment and how this same simple learning algorithm allowing for tuning up if I'm fast learner or slow learner or, you know, all kinds of things that you can go into details. So you have really nice alignment. I just didn't have time. That was one of my kind of top three or four studies I, I wanted to present. But we are certainly looking at that level of individual learners. I think that Dagmar and I had at least two kind of studies that that tried to engage with this more directly, saying that there are, there are people who are uh, uh, inclined to be good implicit learners. There are people who are possibly inclined to be more explicit learners, and such and such. So we we kind of try to 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 dig deeper into that problem, but that's just a scratch on 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 on, on that. Yeah, certainly it would be interesting also, I mean, both experimentally and, and computationally to address. It's possible. I mean, all those learning machines, even this simpler one, has uh, they have um, so-called free parameters or learning parameters. And by tuning them up in certain way, you basically are claiming, well, I have one uh, artificial learner that is very fast and, and very erratic. And then I have another one that is more careful and you know it trusts its previous knowledge so it would not update too much and so on and so forth. And then you see how that chimes with your experimental data. Okay, one- Excuse, one... excuse me, Stasha, I have to leave now to set up the other meeting, okay? Okay. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. I, I'll just let one more question from, from Dushica. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Would you aim for the direct mapping of grapheme phoneme cues onto semantics, or do you find that separate G2F and F2F mappings are necessary uh, represent the nature of things? It's again, it's very, thank you, Dushica, for a really good question. Um, it's, it's a really difficult one. We tried with at least three networks, uh, somehow for me intuitively, uh, uh, from, from uh, let's say more from, from practical perspective to have a little bit better control, uh, uh, we do train them separately, but I don't think that actually they live, if they live, uh, they, they actually live uh, uh, orthogonal to one another. Um, that's, that's not at all what's going on. You just 
try as a researcher best you can to slice things and, and keep some things under control and then engage with others. So uh, what we did also in one of our previous studies, we used uh, this behavioral profile categories uh, because now if you think you have those letter sequences, two word forms, which is kind of uh, bottom up from simpler units to, to meaningful units, let's say. And then you have horizontal learning from word forms to other word forms. And then we introduce top down from, from linguistic abstractions, very naive one, uh, to, to, to word forms. And we got interesting results. So I would assume there are many possible networks and they, they, they need to speak with one another. Um, but, but there are two separate issues. This one is methodologically, I would go separate just to see what's going on and to have some kind of sense, some sense of proper, let's say experimental control in the sense that I keep some things constant and I, I try other stuff uh, uh, to vary systematically other things. Uh, but, but conceptually, I don't think that they, they are separate to one another. I don't know whether that answer you answers your question, but <clears throat> thank you, Petra. I think we need to wrap up now okay. because people need to get to their dinners, I suppose, eventually. Uh, I uh, just would like to. Uh, well, one thing is obviously there's more material, so hopefully you will visit us in Galway again. And I you know, we can kind of organize maybe some extra seminar or something. But yeah. we, before people leave, I would just like to uh, remind you about our seminar uh, next month, which will be Marion Mullen. Uh, she will be talking about uh, Irish uh, storytelling and Irish narratives. So we're looking forward to see you then at our next seminar.